Hello, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us in our uh, federal government contracting subcontracting webinar series. Uh, early, earlier this year, we did a series on the FAR supplements and covered all of the departments and some of the agencies that had supplements. And uh, we decided to uh, progress from there and move on to subcontracting. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recording as well as the slides uh, on our website, on our YouTube channel, uh, on Gov events, and a couple other platforms. A uh, quick blurb about us. We are based in downtown Washington, D.C. and provide services for companies that sell products, services, or software to the government. Um, our main services include GSA schedule and we do some uh, market analysis reports, uh, other services and that we provide can be found on our website under the About Us section. We also host events typically over at the Kennedy Center. We're working on putting a holiday event on in December. So if you're on our newsletter, you'll find out about that. Typically draws about 200 plus federal government contractors. And we mix that with uh, corporate sponsors as well as federal government uh, departments and agencies. So stay tuned for that. You can also check our website under the event section. Uh, we now have almost 600 uh, complimentary webinars on our YouTube channel uh, with close to 5,000 subscribers. Our newsletter um, just reached 24,100 plus uh, subscribers, most of which are federal contractors. So if your company is selling to federal contractors, we do have advertising uh, options for you. I've got quite a few LinkedIn followers as well. And if you want to get a media packet from us, uh, just send us an email to the hello at jennifershouse.com. We'll send over pricing and options for you. Okay, uh, we also wanna thank our webinar sponsors, which um, allows us to provide these complimentary to you. Uh, and first up, uh, well, first we want to thank our friends over at uh, Set Aside Alert. Uh, they are a monthly publication that um, is subscription-based, and they provide information on contracts that are available for women-owned, veteran-owned, hub-zone, 8A, um, service-disabled veteran-owned companies, and all of the other uh, set-aside designations. Uh, it's a great publication, and, uh, and they also list events and our webinars in there, so we want to thank them for uh, sharing the events with you and the webinars. Um, Gov Events is also a, another platform that we use to post our uh, events as well as webinars and the recordings, and our friends over the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority have a public-facing calendar where our webinars are also posted, so special thanks and shout out to those Oops. Uh, more formally, we do want to thank the Virginia PTAC. Uh, the Virginia PTAC is based out of George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, although I think they've just moved their location, um, their headquarters. They offer free one-on-one -on -one counseling on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Uh, online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on your business location. If you are interested in learning more, just use the links provided to contact the PTAC. Okay, BidSpeed uh, is also another uh, sponsor here in our webinar series. The BidSpeed platform helps you win and increase your probability of winning government contracts. They have opportunities from every federal, state, and local public source in the US. If you're looking for a compliance matrix, a proposal template, a strategic uh, teaming partner, or details on an expiring contract, BidSpeed can help. BidSpeed is an official partner of the SBA 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Contact BidSpeed at the email or phone number here to learn more. Uh, Gov White Papers 2023 is right around the corner. Whether you're focused on your own professional development or your organization sales and marketing, understanding government and military best practices, uh, can make a big in impact on effective planning for the new year. Gov White Papers is your free content resource for finding and sharing government and military technical trends, policies, and recommendations. Browse thousands of free white papers, ebooks, case studies, and more to stay informed on topics like infrastructure, 
public safety, technology, energy, education, and procurement, plus upload your content for free to boost website traffic and exposure in the government community. Uh, get in touch to discover B2G advertising solutions such as lead generation, display ads, white label content creation, email marketing, and more. Uh, claim your free membership at govwhitepapers.com so you can sharpen your skill set and head into 2023 armed with the knowledge to help you succeed. GAIN. Uh, GAIN is the premier business to government conference that brings together the brightest minds in the community. Government Marketing University's goal is to help you grow your government uh, MARCOM wisdom, accelerate connecting with your target government audience by learning new trends and techniques, and innovate annual strategy, tactics, and tools. The on-demand event is focused on training, actionable takeaways, and research insights to help you boost your brand and drive more revenue in 2023. Gain 2022 on demand will be available from October 24th, which was two days ago. Um, and it's available just by clicking on the, uh, the gainconference.com link. Okay, so the reason why we are here today is to discuss subcontracting opportunities at Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD. Uh, we've got two great speakers today. They're going to cover um, some valuable content for you. And so let's just go ahead and dig in with our agenda, uh, which you can see here on the screen. I'll probably make this uh, pretty snappy and pretty quick today. So let me just go ahead and get started with our panelist uh, introductions. First, we've got uh, Leela Saleem. She's with GovSpend. Uh, they are a platform that provides um, data for government contractors and uh leela i'll let you uh probably uh speak a little more uh in depth and knowledgeable than uh than what i can do uh, about govspend and i'll turn the floor over to you thank you so much jennifer it's great to be here hi everyone my name is leela salim i'm the relationship management team lead for federal at govspend um, FedMine is a business intelligence platform that is aggregating from 18 sources and bringing that intelligence to our customers so that they can do market research, stay up to date with current opportunities, um, industry trends, track the competition, all kinds of uh, good resources within FedMine. As of last year, we were acquired by GovSpend, which is the largest uh, platform for purchase order data in the state and local market. So now we bring the best of Fed and SLED combined. Um, and I'm so happy to be here to talk about these subcontracting opportunities at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, the data that we are presenting today is for the prime contracts. It's coming from FPDS, and the subcontracting data comes from USA Spending. They're getting that information from FSRS. Keep in mind that the subcontracting data is self-reported by the prime or the sub. And typically the federal government and the SBA look at ESRS. However, that data set is not made public. I'll let well, you Lee, gonna... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, question. we're just gonna stop you real quick and uh, we're just gonna introduce Casey and then uh, we'll dig into your presentation. I'm sorry. Fantastic. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and we also wanna thank uh, Casey McKinnon from Cohen Siglius uh, for joining us. Uh, Casey, it's great to have you here. I'll let you say a couple words and I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, hi, Jennifer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody today. My name is Casey McKinnon. I'm a partner in Cohen Seglius's government contracting group. Uh, myself and my colleagues practice nothing but federal contracting law and everything that comes along with it. Starts as early as protests through compliance and then appeals and disputes and litigation that comes after the fact. Uh, we're headquartered in Philadelphia. My group is located in DC and I'm looking forward to discussing some uh, HUD issues today. Great, thank you so much.
Hey, Jennifer, I think you're muted right now. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so we've got links here to the uh, to the main HUD page, as well as the small business office. Uh, if you're looking for a procurement forecast, uh, some departments and agencies are better about uh, providing this information. Uh, some have more current and more uh, in-depth information than others. So um, just click on the link there, and then don't forget to look at uh, the agencies and departments, or I'm sorry, the agencies and bureaus within HUD. Uh, if you're looking at the SBA scorecard and trying to do some reverse engineering, for example, if you're woman-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, or any of the other designations, um, you can look to see how well or not HUD did in meeting those goals uh, and use that as a talking point uh, when you're uh, making your pitch. Okay, uh, I'm going to mute myself now and turn this back over to uh, to Leela Salim from GovSpend. And Leela, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so as I was saying, FedMine is getting the data uh, for prime contract. It's coming from FPDS. And then the subcontracting data is coming from USA Spending. We do a great job of connecting the prime to the sub at the task order level in FedMine. So it's really granular and gives you a good understanding of who's winning and who are they working with. As a small business, uh, you're gonna wanna understand who are the top primes that are winning contracts and what type of work are they doing? Who are they working with in terms of subcontracting? Is there a subcontract plan requirement within that prime contract? Um, and that data is all made public. So we would wanna filter these searches based on keywords or NAICS codes, whichever you would like to use for your searching in FedMine. Even if there isn't a subcontract plan requirement, you still wanna be talking to those prime contractors, especially if you're in the same line of work. So first and foremost, we wanna focus on the top companies within an agency. If you've made your agency target list and you know these top agencies are buying what you sell, um, you're gonna to wanna to first look at those top agencies and we, um, We've ran the last, the top 10 here for HUD last fiscal year. I'm going to talk about the top five um, so we can see, you know, who are they working with at subcontractors and try to focus on that. Um, so let's look at the top five within today's agency for Department of HUD. All right, the first one up is Celine. Um, looks like they have, we've linked their website. Some agents or some of these companies do have um, a website and then a location within their site where you can register as a interested vendor to work with them. So it all just depends on the business. Um, next slide, please. Oh, there it is. There's their small business liaison office. So we've linked that there that you can uh, register as a vendor. Okay, so Celine Finance, they've done hundreds of millions of dollars at HUD in recent years. Over 50 million last year uh, was awarded. And um, their big project there is working with the mortgage program that has a ceiling amount of 821 million. I believe that's on the next slide. Uh, and that's gonna show you digging into that most recent award from last fiscal year, you can see the base and all options value of this prime contract for Celine and um, what they're working on, that requirement at the bottom. It also includes that subcontract plan. So this is when the government is saying, you know, look, if you're gonna be awarding subcontracts, you need to include that in the plan for that and report your subs. So this would be a great target as someone who wants to, you know, break through and start working with HUD or working on this type of mortgage-backed securities program. Next slide. Okay, number two is HP, also known as Periton or Perspecta in this case. Uh, we've linked their site there, um, HP Enterprise Services. But they hold a huge data center contract with HUD. Um, can we go to the next slide? This is just showing the breakdown year over year of their presence federally. Um, definitely they've been doing 
a ton of work with a ton of agencies. HUD is sort of in the middle of this list with 51 million awarded last fiscal year. Next slide. Um, so I honed in on the large project that they have for data centers. And you can use FedMind to really uh, see their relationships and who they have already reported as their subcontractors. So this is a large pro project for continued enterprise infrastructure support. And it was awarded to HP as a sole source, meaning it wasn't even competed. It was just sort of determined that they were the only business that can provide the type of work. Uh, this would be a great target to tap into and try to get in on the subcontracting team for the numerous opportunities that they likely have here. Next slide. Okay, so there's the listing of how we uh, show it in FedMine. You can see all of the subcontractors that HP has reported. And you can even click into those within FedMine to get an understanding of the work that each of these individual companies is doing. How much did they award? Uh, what's the description of those subcontracts? Next slide. Okay, awesome. Number three is 24 Asset Management Corporation. Um, they really got their big break in 2022. Yes, there's the link for their small business liaison office as well. Um, next slide shows that um, this is a, well, this company is um, a minority owned business and in fiscal 22 is when they really sort of started to break out into getting the big award from HUD. Um, it's a field service management contract there, and it's an IDV contract under the NAICS code for property managers. I think the next slide will show this in more detail. You can see those individual actions that were awarded in fiscal 22, and um, this contract also has a ceiling amount of over 64 million. So this would be a great, a great, another great target. They're the number three top contractor at HUD. Next up, we have Carrington Mortgage Company. Um, they hold a mortgage services contract that has growth of hundreds of millions of dollars. They, for this type of work, they could always need staffing. Um, you can see this is sort of breaking down the single family master subservicer services. Um, the ultimate completion date there is at the end of 2024. 20, um, what's been obligated and year over year revenue from HUD going into um, Carrington. So this, you know, this is a prime example of if your company offers staffing or other type of work that might feed into the, this mortgage services contract it would be a great opportunity. Here's just showing the specifics of um, this contract award. You can see the program code that they're using. There is an individual subcontract plan noted at the bottom uh, right column. This is a sole source award and um, it is under that the NAICS code right there on the left. N next slide. Okay, the last company that we're gonna talk about is DGG. They hold a similar award uh, for field service management. We've linked their small business liaison office. And here's a sort of snapshot of their HUD earnings year over year. Um, so this contract also includes a subcontract plan and it would make them another great target for their longevity and growth potential at HUD. Next slide. There, this is just gonna show you all the breakdown of those individual actions. And um, for every company and vendor profile that we have in FedMine, you can really get a good understanding for these companies. You can track their whereabouts federally um, and you can also get their contact information. So that's 
sort of how our clients are utilizing this information to make those relationships, get that intelligence and breakthrough in terms of subcontracting. All righty. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to stop talking now. Great. Thank it. you so much, uh, Leila. Great presentation. Thanks for the uh, the data. And if anybody has questions or uh, I think you guys have demos that you can do on your platform and the, uh, the services that you offer for uh, market intelligence reports. Great. Uh, okay. So now we're going to dig into marketing uh, best practices. Um, pretty self-explanatory here. This doesn't really change from week to week. Uh, re, you know, depending upon the department that we're covering, uh, but you certainly want to know uh, your customer before you start, uh, before you even begin any contact. So whether you're using FedMine or just going to the uh, public sites, FPDS, SAM.gov, USA Spending, uh, do as much homework as you can uh, to learn about the Prime, look at the contracts that they've won, sign up for their newsletter, get the Google Alerts for uh, any relevant news that could impact their business, uh, especially because most of these guys, there are obviously exceptions, but most are going to be large businesses um, that uh, will probably be in the news. Um, and most will have a uh, a site on their uh, website where you, or a section on their website where you can register. Uh, make sure that your SAM.gov registration is complete, that you have a customized capability statement for them. Um, and that you're just not uh, randomly registering on their site that you really know kind of why you are registering with them and what it is you're going to bring to the table. Uh, you can also look on LinkedIn to look at the um, SBLOs, which is the Small Business Liaison Officer, which is typically the title that the individual or individuals within these large businesses will hold who are responsible for um, identifying and working with subcontractors. Sometimes it's a contract administrator, just depends uh, on kind of the, the size of the, the business and uh, what responsibilities have fallen into what person's uh, lap. Sometimes it's a diversity team, um, but those are some of the, um, the keywords that you probably wanna look for on LinkedIn within those companies. Uh, as I mentioned, sign up for their newsletter, any events, you know, associations where that company uh, is participating. Uh, these are great ways to actually build and form re sustainable relationships that will at some point hopefully lead into revenue and contracts for you. Um, and again, as I mentioned, just bring your customized capability statement. Every company should have just one standard capability statement and then your custom capability statement, which is geared towards a specific opportunity. So you're not just going to contact HP, you should have an opportunity that maybe there's a contract that's coming up um, for a recompete that uh, they're the incumbent. So make sure that your capability statement again is geared towards the opportunity. Uh, and I think it's going to take us over to Casey. So uh, we're going to dig into the legal perspective and Casey McKinnon from Cohen Seclius will join us. Um, Again, we've got a link here to the uh, the FAR supplement on HUD, which will go over uh, some of the contracting nuances uh, related to the rules and regulations. I'm going to stop talking, and Casey, the floor is all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And I will note that much like the marketing best practices that you just went through, much of what I have to say today is applicable to any government subcontract. doesn't matter what agency you're working for. Most of these best practices and legal concerns apply to just about any agency out there. So I went through a, three, a set of three hour-long presentations on these best practices last month with some of my colleagues. I will endeavor to keep it shorter than that. <laughs> so I tried to boil my slides down to the, the most crucial things the subcontractor should know, working on a HUD contract, or, excuse me, subcontract or any other subcontract for the federal government. Next slide, please. So I'm framing my discussion here around what I would like to reference is the most frequent issues that bring people to talk to me about their problems. What, what ends up leading to a legal dispute, a legal problem that you have to get a lawyer involved in? And the first one that comes up more often than anything is a failure to understand 
the terms of your subcontract and the prime contract along with it. So subcontractors often overlook their subcontract, don't dig far enough into the terms and conditions in that contract, and then down the road are unhappy with the consequences of those terms. So my first point is that the, the prime contractor is typically drafting that subcontract. Now it's a matter of negotiation after that, but assume that the prime is intending upon enforcing the terms in that subcontract. So if you see something that looks overly onerous, unfair, you need to bring it up before you enter into the contract because if you wait until later, you can end up in a very one-sided or lopsided dispute with your prime contractor. Along the same line, ambiguities should be addressed before signing that subcontract. So don't make assumptions about what the parties are agreeing to. Do not presume that things will work out in a certain way. If something seems off, if something seems conflicting or ambiguous, make sure you bring it up before you enter into that subcontract. It's always better to be clear on the front end. It, uh, on another note, make sure that you take a look at the prime contract as well. Almost every government subcontract flows down or incorporates in part or in whole the terms of the prime contract. So it may not be the contract that you're entering into, but you likely have obligations arising out of that prime contract. So make sure you get a copy of the prime contract or at least the relevant portions and specs and make sure that you understand what obligations you're entering into as a subcontractor. And then finally, these terms get used interchangeably, uh, a little naively at times, but are you entering into a, a purely subcontract relationship? Is it more of a teaming agreement? Are you as the sub going to be mentioned in the prime contractor's proposal? Will it be a joint venture? So it's important to think about those distinctions between the different relationships the parties can have. They can have a lot to do with whether or not the parties actually secure the contract and what their performance looks like down the road. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as avoiding problems and avoiding troublesome litigation, one of the most important things you can do is make sure that you maintain proper documentation and provide notice, even when it seems silly because everyone is aware of what's happening. So again, the best way to avoid litigation disputes is effectively to prepare as if those things are going to come along. And the biggest thing you can do is properly document things. That can look like daily reports, QC reports, emails to provide notice and document certain issues that have arisen. All of those things become useful down the road. You don't want to have to rely upon people's recollection of things or try to put the, the puzzle back together down the road. So document, document, document. Second point is handshake, handshake deals are inherently risky. They work great as long as everyone is still in agreement, but as soon as one party no longer agrees, that handshake deal is really quite worthless at that point in time. So if you're entering into handshake of deals, verbal agreements, follow up via email just to confirm, here's what we've agreed to. Let me know if that looks wrong to you. Having some documentation of that can be very helpful. As far as putting through claims to the government, if you think there's a, a change that's occurred or something where you're entitled to additional time or money, they're gonna require, and by they I mean the government, thorough documentation of those claims and costs. So it doesn't work quite the same way if you're in a private sector negotiation. The government has regulations that speak to thorough documentation, notice, proof of your costs. So keeping all of those things up to date along the way can help quite a bit down the road. And then finally, failure to provide notice can waive claims. This is something that is inherent in every contract to some degree, but in government contracting is very important. So if an issue comes up where you're being delayed, you're incurring additional costs, you're being asked to perform additional work, and especially if it appears that the government is the one really driving that issue, you need to provide that notice and your contract will identify what period of time you have to provide the notice. And if you fail to provide that notice, you can end up waiving your claim altogether. So when an issue arises, you don't have to write a 10 page letter. It can just be a brief email letter, but putting everyone on notice that something has occurred and you'll be incurring additional time or money because of it. Next slide, please. Another important point that some subcontractors overlook is to understand the relationships between the various parties to a government contract. The FAR is kind of the Bible when it comes to government contracting, but in reality, it doesn't provide a whole lot of protection for subcontractors. It's really written as the relationship between the government and the prime contractor. So in many cases, the subcontractor will assume that the FAR might provide some protection against some bad outcomes, but in reality, 
the FAR doesn't speak a whole lot to subcontract relationships. That's really dictated more by your individual subcontract. You might have some obligations to comply with certain FAR provisions, but it isn't going to be there to help you out if you end up in a dispute with your prime necessarily, because the government has its contract with the prime and that's the relationship that they're most concerned about. My third point, who is responsible for changes, delays, and other impacts? This comes up very frequently in the subcontracting world where as a sub, you understand that you've been asked to perform additional work, you've been delayed, something has occurred that would entitle you to some sort of equitable adjustment. However, it's important to recognize whether that issue is caused by the prime or instead by the government because the, uh, the remedies that come from that look very different. If your dispute is with the, the government, you're gonna to have to pass through a claim up through the prime to the government. Whereas if your dispute is simply sub to prime, then your dispute is gonna be dictated by the terms of your subcontract. So important to recognize to the extent there are issues or problems arising on the project or on the contract, who is actually leading the way causing these problems. And then finally, payment rules and requirements are crucial. One of the only protections the FAR does provide for subcontractors pertains to payment. So once the prime contractor has been paid by the government for work that you have performed, they are obligated to pay the subcontractor that money within a short period of time, typically seven days. So in the case that you are in a dispute with your prime contractor, one of the most important things to find out is has the government been billed for the work you've performed? And if so, has the government paid the prime contractor? Next slide, please. So it's also important as a sub to understand disputes procedures in government contracting. As I noted before, any claim that a subcontractor has for issues that are ultimately caused by the government must be passed through through the prime contractor up to the government. The government is only interested in hearing claims or receiving claims from the prime as the one that's the entity they have a contract with. So if the government has caused any issues on your performance as a sub, we'll need to pass that claim up to the prime and they'll pass it through to the government. Another important point to make that differs quite a bit from the private sector is that you effectively have no right to walk off or simply refuse to perform on a government contract. And that's true as a prime, but it's also true as a sub. Whereas the government cannot terminate your subcontract if you fail to perform, the prime certainly can do so. And if it turns out that a subcontractor has failed to perform, refused to perform, and then ultimately impacts the government's contract, you can end up debarred from government contracting and there's a whole litany of terrible outcomes that can happen. So no matter how bad things get, it's always better to try to stumble along to the finish line, to limp through the process, even if it's necessary, because if you simply refuse and stop working, there's some very negative outcomes that can come. As far as disputes, it's important to understand the difference between request for equitable adjustment, known as REAs, versus claims. Request for equitable adjustment, REAs, are effectively just informal requests. They typically don't require any legal formalities. They look almost like a letter. You're simply asking the government or the prime contractor to award you additional money or time. In contrast, the certified claim does have some legal formalities that are required, but it also obligates the receiving party here, the government, to respond within a certain period of time, and it's a precursor to any litigation. So it's important to understand the difference between those two, and they each have their own time and place. And if you ever have questions, it's good to consult with a lawyer or someone who's familiar with disputes with the government to figure out which one of those might be right for you. And then finally, it's always important to note the False Claims Act applies to any government contract. You cannot submit a claim or request with what you would call negotiating fluff. Every claim that goes through to the government must be for the exact amount of money that has been spent because of an issue. There can be no fluff, no negotiating position because the government views those as false claims and they can lead to significant financial penalties and in the worst cases, even jail time. So please avoid that. Next slide, please. All right. And although as a lawyer, I'm not supposed to tell anybody this, your best practice in general in government contracting is to work to avoid disputes. So understand that the rules are written in a way that is not to benefit the contractor or a subcontractor. The rules are written to benefit the government and the taxpayer. 
And if you end up in legal disputes with the government, it's important to keep that in mind, that the rules are not set in your favor here. The government generally is going to win because the rules are set to benefit the government, not you as a prime or a subcontractor. Project personnel are more likely to agree to equitable or logical remedies. So it's always better if you can reach a project level, the boots on the ground level uh, agreement about a dispute you're having. It may not be the perfect outcome, but often that's much better than fighting for long periods of time, which can cost money in terms of legal fees, but also just delays payment to you. So to the extent you can reach a reasonable agreement with the, the parties actually performing and administering the contract, that's usually gonna be your better outcome. However, engage legal counsel early if you'd like to avoid the need for litigation. So sometimes a well-crafted letter, a phone call to counsel within the government can avoid the whole need for disputes. And in my group, that's a lot of what we do for our clients is we don't wanna to go to litigation. We'd rather make a phone call to government counsel, explain the situation, and maybe reasonable minds can prevail and avoid the need for any large scale dispute. And finally, open and frequent dialogue with both the prime contractor and the government is always a best practice. It's never better to wait to disclose that things have occurred, to not provide notice. So if issues are arising, problems are arising, open that dialogue, write an email, ask for a meeting or a phone call. That's typically your best way to get out from under the problem and move forward with your performance. Next slide, please. Uh, a frequent issue that comes up in government subcontracting refers to FAR flowdown clauses. And those are those FAR clauses that end up in a prime contract and are then inserted into your subcontract, either by reference or actually inserted in that subcontract, taking the requirements from the government and placing them all the way down into your subcontract. And it's an issue with that gives rise to a lot of confusion, misunderstandings, but overall, Understand that those flow down clauses may bring obligations that the prime contractor owes to the government to have you now as a subcontractor owe those to the prime and the government as well. So before you enter into any subcontract, review the flow downs. Look at them, see if they make sense. Should they be included? Do they look applicable to the work you're doing? And if not, you may be in a position to request that they simply be removed. Also understand that not every clause, every FAR clause that's flowed down into a subcontract actually has meaning. So our clients often have questions where our prime contractors inserted a FAR clause into their subcontract that really doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't seem applicable. Well, in some cases, there's no need to remove it because it simply doesn't apply. So for example, if there's a FAR provision that speaks to everyone being needing to uh, wear seat belts on a project, well, if you're not driving any cars in the performance of your work, it's an nullity. It, it really just doesn't matter. So don't necessarily get tripped up by FAR clauses that simply don't apply. Next, beware of the Christian doctrine. And this is probably one of the most unfair legal doctrines in government contracting. The Christian doctrine is a doctrine that states that if a FAR clause was required to go into a prime contract or a subcontract and someone forgets it or omits it for some reason, it will be read into that subcontractor contract as if it was there from the beginning. So even if a government personnel makes a mistake and forgets to include a particular clause, it will be read into your subcontract as if it was there from the beginning by court. So if you open up the terms of your subcontract and it looks like something's missing, something you know should apply, take a look there, ask some questions and find out why it's not included in your contract because if it should be there, in effect, it will be there. And finally, flow downs can be in full or by reference. So in some cases, you'll get a full laundry list of the whole clauses that have been flowed down. And the, on the other hand, you might just get a list. These certain FAR provisions will apply to your subcontract and it's incumbent upon you to go look at what those clauses say and how they'll apply. Next slide, please. And then I've added in one slide here, other legal considerations, consider it sort of a potpourri of leftover concerns that come up a lot. Depending on the type of work you're doing, Buy America, Buy American and the Trade Agreements Act may or may not apply, but if they do, be very wary of them. They're very confusing and difficult and give rise to a litany of legal problems during performance. Second one, a contractor code of business ethics. Every government contractor and subcontractor is supposed to have such a code of ethics. And it can be very helpful to have one in place because if you have a rogue employee that fails to, to comply with your code of ethics, that can provide the, your company some protection to say that, no, no, we had 
procedures in place, this person simply didn't follow them, but we did what we could on our end. Uh, beware of the potential for audits, in particular cost audits do come up. So if you're claiming money from the government, expect that someone's going to give some scrutiny as to your costs and how you've proven them. And then finally, be aware of the differences between fixed price and cost reimbursable contracts. Depending on the type of work you're doing, you might fall into one bucket or the other. And there's a great difference in the sorts of requirements that apply, uh, payment procedures, proof of costs, all those things. So keep an eye on that and be aware of what your prime contractors payment structures, as well as what's inserted into your subcontract. All right, great presentation, Casey. Thank you for uh, for wrapping it up here with some uh, outstanding legal points that, again, apply not only to HUD, but across to all of uh, federal government. And Leela Salim uh, from GovSpend, who um, graciously provided us with the data and insight on the top uh, five contractors at HUD and uh, some best practices on working with them and where to go to uh, contact those vendors. Uh, if you want more insight on the data and analytics behind um, any of the opportunities, contact Leela. And if you guys have legal questions, uh, Casey is your go-to. You've got their contact information here. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, we will round out our series uh, will end on December 12th, which is a Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, if you're looking for the recording uh, from this or any of the other previous webinars on subcontracting, you can find those on our website under the tab that's called subcontracting. Um, this should be up in about 24 hours, uh, if not sooner. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. And a special thanks again to our sponsors.